Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning. We're here on our Wednesday morning um, series. Today, I'm going to be talking about snakes, poisonous plants, and ticks. I'm Nancy Berlin. I'm the Natural Resource Specialist and Master Gardener Coordinator at Cooperative Extension in Prince William. Thank you for joining us today. We'll save questions for the chat after the <clears throat> presentation. We're going to start with snakes, and these are going to be specific to Prince William County. Um, <clears throat> other areas of Virginia have different populations of snakes. <clears throat> A few introductory comments here. <clears throat> if you're close enough to see the head and the eye shape, you're probably too close. But it can't be used alone to make an identification of a snake um, definitively. You need a combination of factors, plus you need to be familiar with what the local species are. And that's what we're going to cover today in this presentation. And not every orange and brownish snake is a copperhead. There are some beautifully patterned snakes that have that coloration. And not every water snake is a cottonmouth or water moccasin. Northern Virginia is out of the range for cotton mousing, and that includes Prince William. <clears throat> Rat snakes come in other colors besides black, and I'll be showing you some pictures of those. The best defense against snakes <clears throat> is education. They're not aggressive, they, they hide, and their best defense system is in place, and they use it only when they feel threatened. So the best advice is to leave them alone and don't threaten them. They are a very important part of our ecosystem. In Virginia, it's illegal to kill any species of snake unless the snake poses an imminent health and safety threat. You're allowed to capture and possess up to five live snakes, but you have to release them within 30 days. And I would recommend you don't capture any. Snakes are a help to us. They eat garden pests like slugs and voles and grubs. That includes Japanese beetles and chafers. <clears throat> and even some cicadas. All snakes are predators, and they uh, eat a wide variety of um, uh, species in our ecosystem. All snakes bite them, and some are very small, though, and the bite will be um, less consequential. They bite to capture prey or for self-defense. So again, the best advice is to leave them alone. But the severity of the bite depends on where it's located on your body, the type of snake, how sensitive you are, and the age and the health of the person that's affected. Um, you should seek medical help for all bites, even non-venomous, because they can cause infection, release bacteria, uh, cause allergic reactions. So seek medical attention. We're not here to talk about <clears throat> how to medically treat. That would be the, the area for your physician. Snakes get shed their spin, skin periodically, and it, there are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, <clears throat> they keep growing continually through their lives until they mature. Uh, after they mature, the growth is uh, relatively small. So sometimes you'll see a snake skin in your garden that they've wriggled out of or in your compost pile. So. One way of telling uh, snakes apart is whether they have smooth scales or keeled scales, and that's in a lot of dichotomous keys or keys to help you identify. So I wanted to define that keeled scales have that ridge down the center. And snakes with keeled snails, <laughs> keeled scales include some venomous and some non-venomous. Uh, but if, you, if you're close enough to see the, the keels on the scales, I think you're probably too close to the snake. <clears throat> you can see the list. Uh, king snakes and black snakes are, have smooth scales, and so they're a little bit more shiny looking. <clears throat> but remember, snakes are predators, and we depend on them. Um, you can see the different shapes heads between the non-venomous and the venomous. But again, this is not definitive, uh, and, if, and you have to be fairly close to see it. <clears throat> Snakes are never going to win a popularity contest. They're part, but they're part of our food web. They're they're an important part of our Earth's biodiversity. They're a natural form of pest control, keeping rats and mice and even cicadas uh, in check. 
some species that are harmless to people prey on venomous snakes. So that reduces your chance of having an encounter with a venomous snake. Many species are under threat. So remember, we're all linked together by bonds and in that food web. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to avoid if you want to control snakes and keep them out of certain areas of the environment, maybe like your house. Never use a glue trap, a glue sheet or board to manage any pest problem. Um, those traps are inhumane. They just trap the animal until the animal starves to death or bleeds to death. Um, and it captures many non-target um, species on it. Avoid the use of poison for pest control because poison <clears throat> um, beta traps often um, a, a, an owl or another raptor will pick up that poison in the animal, targeted animal, <clears throat> and owls and raptors are poisoned by those <clears throat> um, products. Remember, it's illegal to, to kill any species of snake unless it poses an imminent health or safety risk. Here's a glue trap. You can see it's caught a lot of different things on here. I have a friend who's a vet in Haymarket, and she has routinely had to release snakes from glue traps, some successfully, some not successfully. So um, we recommend that you never use those for any, any use. Virginia Tech puts out a pest management guide for homeowners once a year, usually in the beginning of the year, and the 2021 recommendations for insect control, any pest control, uh, disease control are all in this uh, guide. It's not a very easy uh, guide for a homeowner to um, be utilized, but it's, um, it's very helpful to us for making recommendations, and those are the only recommendations we give because they're research-based. So the, one of the first things they mention is it, um, eliminate the source of food for snakes, you know, near your house, in your house. If you have a snake in your house, you most likely have a rodent problem. And to get rid of rodents, um, don't use glue traps, but the spring traps are good. Remove any food, um, uh, grains, dog food, uh, open compost, bird feeders, they, they all draw rodents, which in turn draw snakes. Don't let your grass get too long. You know, in, in our best lawns program for homeowners, uh, for recommendations for turf, we ask that you um, keep your grass at about three inches, but don't get it any longer than four inches. Uh, grass at three inches <coughs> to three and a half inches will help shade out weeds and, and keep your um, turf healthier. Uh, don't use any mothballs. These are toxic. They're not a recommended practice. Eliminate hiding places near the place that you don't want snakes to be, near your house, near playground areas. Uh, keep shrubs away from the building foundations um, where, where snakes and rodents can hide. Avoid excess mulching. Two to three inches is enough. Um, excess mulch will bring voles in that will, can damage the roots of your plants and the bark, and it can also attract snakes. Sometimes large rocks in your landscape can attract snakes because they like to get on there and sun themselves, warm themselves up. They're cold-blooded. So maybe choose a tighter, smaller-fitting rock like gravel or river rock. Virginia Tech also recommends um, that if you really need an area to be uh, free of venomous snakes, if you have a copperhead problem, maybe around a garden or around a play area, um, you can put up fencing. Keep the fencing mesh less than four, four inches, one, one fourth inch or less, and slant it outward. Keep the vegetation away from that. Um, if, if you have uh, bigger than that mesh, a snake can get caught in it and die, um, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, firms using pesticides must have a Virginia license for pesticide application for um, for, for animals. Repellent uh, is marketed, but it's not proven effective, so I would not waste my money on that. Here in the bottom corner, you see a snake caught in a mesh like a cicada netting or, or a um, squirrel netting, and so you, if you use any netting for birds or 
to keep other things out of your garden, you need to make sure it's small enough mesh so a snake can't get caught in it. We've had to, before we realized this at the teaching garden, we had to release some snakes by cutting it. And, you know, we don't want you to have to deal with that. The top picture is a picture of a snake with a golf ball. Some people put golf balls in their hen house to keep snakes from eating uh, the, the eggs. Uh, that's not recommended. That will swallow it and die. So um, avoid that. <clears throat> snakes like to be in wood piles in dark, damp places. They do like heat, though, so sometimes you'll see them out in the open. Uh, if your firewood is stacked, keep it off the ground to keep, it, to keep snakes from hiding in there. Um, get rid of junk and lum old lumber in your yard. Uh, remember to not over mulch. Uh, trim your shrubs and lawns appropriately. Uh, mow ta any tall vegetation that, that you frequent often. Uh, avoid cluttered basements and attics and feed and storage areas. Uh, the feed and storage should be put in metal with tight fitting lids. So here's some snakes I found in my yard this spring and they were, it was still when it was very cool out and they were hiding under some of the leaf litter. And so I, uh, as soon as I unearthed them, I covered them back up to let them continue to uh, be there, but um, be hidden. So they, they had a habitat, place, a place to live. So avoid putting your hands in place, places that can't be inspected. We had a master gardener who was dumping some um, brush into his compost pile. And um, in that brush, there was a copperhead. And he got bitten. Um, so use, you might want to use a tool to move brush piles and leaves. Just be aware when you're outside. Um, if you encounter a snake, again, don't handle it. Most bite, bites occur when people try to catch and kill them. Um, wear appropriate clothing when you're in the yard boots, leather gloves, long pants. And with tick and um, mosquito season coming, um, it's, I think our days are over that we can go out in the yard with uh, bare arms and bare legs anymore. <laughs> Be aware that snakes are more active when it's warm uh, and some are more active at night. You can make a noise this, and stomp, so snakes will tend to avoid it, avoid you. Uh, they don't have external ears, but they could feel vibrations from noises. So medical help should be sought for any bite because it can cause an allergic reaction or release bacteria into your body. And um, here are some of the tips that, um, from the CDC. <clears throat> Let's look at some pictures of venomous like snakes at Prince William. The photos and the data are courtesy of Virginia Herpetological Society. You can find them on the web with a lot of really great resources and pictures. So here's a venomous snake. This is um, not common in Prince William, but it is present. It's present almost throughout the whole state. It's kind of pinkish tan with that uh, hourglass figure on the uh, pattern on its back. It has keeled scales. Sometimes they, the young copperheads have a bright yellow tip and they eat mice and amphibians and reptiles and other snakes. Um, they're very, very camouflaged, especially in leaf litter. There was a picture on social media that showed leaves fallen in the fall that were just the color of the copperhead and, and I was hard pressed to find the copperhead in the picture. I think you can probably Google that. <clears throat> Timber rattlesnake is rare in Northern Virginia. Uh, only a few reported uh, sightings. Uh, I know one was near Quantico. Uh, it's been verified, but it's, it's rare in Northern Virginia. And you can see the pattern here. You know, it looks different from the copperhead. Uh, obviously has a rattle to warn you. There's a better picture of it. Usually it occurs at elevations up to 6,000 feet. So once you get out of Prince William County and you go toward Front Royal area, then it becomes more prevalent. <clears throat> Preys on small animals, frogs, and birds. It has a black head with blotches and chevrons instead of hourglasses. 
they emerge in April and May and give birth to a lot of young if, if the conditions are right. Diurnal in the spring, that means they come out during the day and fall and they're nocturnal in the summer. So when you let your dogs out at night, uh, you might want to keep a close watch on them if you live in Copperhead, uh, if you live in a, um, a place where timber rattlesnakes have been seen. Northern Cottonmouth is not in Northern Virginia. If you see a snake swimming in the, in the Bull Run or any of the streams, it's not going to be a Cottonmouth unless somebody has transported one there. Um, you can see where it occurs in Virginia. So th that concludes the venomous snakes of uh, Prince William County. Let's look at some of the non-venomous snakes. We have a pretty wide variety. The Eastern Black Rat Snake uh, has that no eye, eye stripe around, no white eye strap, and it has uh, weakly keeled scales, meaning there is a little ridge, but it's hard to see. The juveniles look a lot different than the um, adults. They have a black and white checkered belly. Uh, they climb really well, so if you see a black snake climbing up a tree, it's probably a black rat snake. They can rattle their tail to warn you to look fierce. Um, so be aware that that's not a timber rattler if it's a black snake. So here's what the juvenile and the, versus the adult looks like, and they have very wide distribution in uh, northern in, in the state of Virginia. <clears throat> here's a black racer. You can see he's smoother. Um, he has uh, still has that white underbelly. And here's some better pictures. And th here's the black racer juvenile. See how different the pattern is from the adult. We're going to compare a black racer and a black rat snake. The black racer has um, is very glossy, and the black rat snake, although in this picture it looks kind of shiny because of the camera, but it's more flat black. Um, they have some differences. You can see the the, the head, um, the coloration of the head is different. Uh, juveniles are <clears throat> are um, a lot different different coloration. The black rat also is the one that climbs well. Black racer can climb, but not, not as well as a black rat snake. Worm snake, cute, small snake, only about 7 to 11 inches, um, sometimes mistaken for a worm. Its Latin name is ominous, uh, which is Latin for pleasing or charming. I think it kind of fits that. Lives in leaf litter and eats small insects and larvae. The case brown snake is probably the most common one that I see in suburban northern Virginia. It has a, a lovely pattern on the back, very secretive, uh, nocturnal, uh, although I've seen him, <laughs> I've unearthed him in the daytime under my wood chip pile or under mulch or if I have a digging board outside. Uh, and so it's really, really common and non-venomous. They hibernate in um, in mounds. So I um, ant, ant mounds and abandoned rodent tunnels, uh, and I'm pretty sure they'll be in the cicada tunnels too, probably. The queen snake, I have not seen one of these, um, but beautiful snake is present, found in, in water, wet areas, urban and agriculture, or drainage ditches. Beautiful red corn snake is very secretive. You can see it has a good camouflage pattern. Uh, some people will mistake this for a copperhead, but the, the coloring is different and the patterning is different. Uh, most often found in the woods, agricultural areas. Red belly snake, be beautiful coloration on top. It's kind of gray-brown. The bottom, it's got a red coloration, very secretive. Uh, not a water snake, found it found in the wood, wooded areas and primarily nocturnal. All these snakes want to hide. They don't, they only sun themselves and are out um, <clears throat> when they need to seek warmth. This is a really wonderful snake, uh, small, about 10 to 15 inches. I finally saw one last year that was about 15 inches, but generally all the ones I've seen have been much smaller. It has that nice yellow ring around it very common in uh, urban settings and forests. Eats earthworms, salamanders, and lizards. Hognose is the <coughs> diva, the actor of the bunch. He has an upturned nose like, like a hog, 
And that's where it gets its name and has very unusual anti-predation behaviors. It'll pretend to, um, pretend to die, inflate its whole body, hiss, and then if that doesn't drive you away, it acts like it's in pain, it, it hangs its tongue out, it rolls over on its back and becomes limp. And then if you, if you hide and you watch it, if when it's left alone, it will look around first to make sure it's safe and then slither off. The colorations can be very, very different on these. <laughs> really cool. And, and a large snake. The mole king snake, sometimes confused with copperheads. The snake doesn't have any hourglass pattern, though. Mostly nocturnal. Sometimes it'll come up after a rain. Uh, Eastern king snake, a gorgeous snake. And he's stout. He's very, he's larger, about 36 to 48 inches. And he, he predates on venomous snakes. Northern rough green snake uh, had, I was, Having some foliage off, some spring uh, blooms after, and put, throwing them on the driveway to put in my compost pile. And, and I, I almost picked one of these up thinking it's, it was a, you know, a, a long leaf of maybe an iris or, uh, or a um, daffodil. And he came out, he, and it, I, I think he was about 36 inches. Uh, he looked maybe only 32, but lives in leafy areas where he can hide and be camouflaged. Eastern milk snake, um, and th this data is from 2019, I want to point out. Beautiful coloration, all orange, black, and white, about 36 inches. This is what's mistaken for the moccasin. If you see a, a snake swimming in the, in the stream, bull run, or... Um, <clears throat> swamp or a marshy area. This this is what it will be in Northern Virginia because we don't have that in this. Here's another picture of a northern water snake. One of these, uh, uh, I was out kayaking. One went over the front of my boat and uh, with a with a fish in his mouth. They're really good swimmers. And he, of course, I followed it over to the. Uh, the bank and watched it eat that fish. He lost it a couple times when the fish tried to flip, but then he caught it again. It was, it was fun to watch. Eastern garter snake, very common. Look at the difference in coloration for this. Uh, they have some really pretty patterns and harmless. Um, <clears throat> found it a lot in the garden. And the earth snake, um, a delicate pattern, very small snake, about seven to 10 inches, eats worms. Uh, found commonly in urban suburban areas. So if you need help identifying a snake, you can send us a picture uh, to mastergardener at pwcgov.org. You can use the iNaturalist app, which is very, very helpful for identifying plants and animals. Or you can go to the Virginia Herpetological Society page. Here's some other resources. This is a really good uh, snake book from... Um, the Virginia Herpetological Society, it's very minimal cost. You can order it, <clears throat> some other resources. So let's move on to poisonous plants. And a lot of these pictures are taken out of the Fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, federal database. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking first about poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. And poison ivy, let me just say, is the master of disguises. It can be, it can look like a tree, it can look like a vine, it can grow almost anywhere, it can climb. It's in rural, urban areas. Uh, it's spread by birds eating the berries. It's considered a pioneer species, which means that if an area is cleared, sometimes this is the, one of the first plants that will move in with invasive plants. It's an, the poison ivy is native but invasive plants tend to move in in cleared areas too. With higher temps and increased rainfall and a rise in carbon dioxide, um, Duke researchers have determined that poison ivy is getting bigger and more potent and likely more allergenic. So every year I get a little poison ivy because I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, which is kind of embarrassing in my role, but um, it, 
it is tricky to identify. See, this is a shrub and a tree and a vine growing up. A, uh, and so um, you have to have some tools in your tool belt uh, to help you identify. And we're going to talk about those next. So here's some myths about poison ivy and the oil uh, that it contains. It's called Jerusalem. And um, poison ivy rash is not contagious from one person to another. If you rub the rash on somebody or another part of your body, it won't spread. The only way it can spread is through direct contact with oil. So if you have a little bit, even a little bit of oil left on you, that can spread it. You can catch poison ivy simply by being near plants. Well, that's not a fact. Uh, you have to, again, have direct contact with your ruchia to get the rash. Leaves of three, let them be. You've all heard that. You need to worry about plants with three leaves. Well, poison sumac has seven to 13 leaves, and poison ivy and oak have three leaves. And then I'll show you some other poisonous plants later um, that, that you should watch out for. You don't have to worry about dead poison ivy plants. Well, indeed you do, because the root Arushia oil stays active up to five years or maybe even longer. There have been some studies on ancient um, deposits. Breaking the blisters will spread the rash. That's not true. Wounds can become infected and you can make scarring worse, but the only way it can be spread is by a smidgen of that Arushia oil. Once you're immune, you're always immune. Well, with allergies, the more that you're exposed to things, sometimes the more susceptible you become. About 90% of all people are allergic to Yerushia. So if you keep exposing yourself, it's likely that you be, will become allergic. Let's see the next one. Okay. So poison ivy rash is called contact dermatitis. You know what it looks like. It's very common. It's been around since 1609, and John Smith gave it its name. You can develop that sensitivity anytime. Yerushia, Yerushi in Japanese means lacquer. And that oil is so potent that a nanogram, which is a billionth of a gram, is needed to cause a rash. And the average person is exposed to about 100 nanograms. Um, fourth of an ounce of it is all you need to cause a rash on every person on earth. Now, you can see these, these facts here. Even specimens centuries old of the oil can be found to give a rash. <clears throat> and it can stay on any surface, tools, uh, gloves, clothing, body, even on dead plants or the plants that are next to a poison ivy. Eurusia is also found in parts of the mango tree and poison ivy and poison oak and poison sumac. Uh, you have to remember, you have to have direct contact with it. And that the Eurusia is present in leaves, stems, flowers, every part of the plant, the roots. Uh, <clears throat> and again, you probably heard stories of people burning it. And it can, if you inhale the smoke, that can contain Eurusia. So let's talk about identifying poison ivy. You've heard let it, leaves of three, let it be. I'm going to give you a few other little ditties to help you remember. Harry Vine, no friend of mine, raggy rope, don't be a dope. So in the winter or even now, you'll see poison ivy vines that are fuzzy, that are growing up a tree, and don't lean against that tree. That's, these are good for helping you remember and also for helping you teach maybe children about what, what poison ivy looks like. The great masquerader. Here's the berries of the poison ivy. Berries and white, danger in sight. Uh, first they're green, then they're white. Longer middle stems, stay away from them. Um, you can see that poison ivy's um, middle leaf is much longer. Has a uh, poison ivy is um, unique in that it has red uh, coloration in the spring, and in the autumn it turns more of an orange. Uh, red leaflets in the spring is a dangerous thing. And here you see the leaves with the little thumb place, um, like a mitten. Uh, and uh, the ditty goes, side leaflets like mittens will itch like the dickens. 
And I have never verified this one, but it came from a reliable source. So if the butterflies land there, don't put your hand there. So turns out they will land on a poison ivy leaf uh, maybe more frequently than other plants. <clears throat> so let's look at some lookalikes. Virginia creeper is often mistaken for poison ivy, but it has five, um, five leaves in the arrangement. And poison ivy has, again, the groups of three, but they grow in the same habitat. I think that's why it contributes to the confusion. Box elder uh, is sometimes called the poison ivy tree, but it's really a maple. It's a native tree. Poison ivy has a red stem and box elder has a green stem, but you can see they look very similar. We're going to look at some more pictures of this. So box elder, you see the leaves are opposite on green stems. And you, you can see right here, these are opposite each other. These are opposite each other. But these have leaflets on them and the leaflets are alternate. They're not right across from each other. So that's a good thing to remember. So is this poison ivy or is this box elder? It is actually poison ivy. And why is that person touching? <laughs> um, so you can see the opposite over here and the alternate over here. That's poison ivy. So here's another picture. This is box elder opposite. But this is raspberry. We also uh, find people um, misidentifying uh, raspberry as poison ivy. And you can see there's a difference in the leaf shape, too, with the poison ivy. So here's the raspberry versus the poison ivy. There's more teeth. There's prickles along the stem. The leaves are a little bit pubescent or, or slightly hairy. So let's have a quiz. Is there poison ivy in here? And if so, find it. Okay, you got it. So in red, those are poison ivy. Virginia creepers in the yellow. Jewelweed, you can see, which is an antidote to poison ivy, grows alongside poison ivy frequently, and it's at the top. This is where poison ivy looks in the winter. Uh, they're hard to identify, but you can still get the ruchiol oil on you in the wintertime. So poison oak, poison oak is not as common. Uh, it's, I have not seen it in Prince William County, although I'm sure it must be here somewhere, but I have seen it along the river, Riverman Park, um, profuse in uh, Fairfax County, and a few other uh, Fairfax County parks, but I, it's not overly common here. They look like oak leaves. There's three leaflets. It can be a vine or a shrub. Here's poison oak again. Some more pictures. You can see it looks like an oak leaf. It has the same urushiol oil. Poison sumac, again, is not very common in Prince William County. That doesn't mean that it's not here or that it won't become more common. It has 7 to 13 leaflets. So a leaflet is when the, the, this stem goes off the main stem and contains the leaves. Here's a picture of poison sumac and the, and the berries. This is staghorn sumac. You'll often see this in the fall. This is the way it looks right now with the clusters of the berries. It's an important native plant. This is not poisonous. Uh, it's important for wildlife, for birds. Uh, you can make tea out of it, so just make sure you have the right sumac. Um, poison ivy rashes, you're probably familiar with this, about how it progresses. Um, the more you rush out, the worse the rash is. So if you've been exposed, you, can, you should wash and scrub your skin with, um, with a product like alcohol or plant wash. I keep tech new. I'm not promoting tech new, but that's one effective product that I keep in my shower in the summertime because I inevitably will come in contact. Some degreasing soap like Dawn or, or another dishwashing soap that is good for oil. You want to scrub your nails because it can get under those nails. And here's some, um, some common uh, techniques for getting rid of it. You may need to uh, seek medical attention if it's on your face or genitals or you have trouble, trouble breathing. Uh, steroids are usually given. So uh, we're not giving medical information here. You can find this information probably on your doctor's helpline.
So prevent contact, L learn to recognize the plants and wear long sleeves, protect yourself. You can put a barrier cream on it um, to avoid contact too if you're in a lot of um, compromising situations. So here's another poisonous plant called giant hogweed. There was a big hubbub about it a few years ago in the newspaper and on the radio. Very, very toxic plant. And it, it's very big, although, you know, it takes a while to get that big. Don't ever touch anything that looks like this. Take a photograph, send photos and the location to us, and we'll report it if we think it is giant hogweed. There are a number of lookalikes, spotted hemlock. Queen Anne's lace is a small version. Um, poison hemlock, cow parsnip. Um, those are some of the lookalikes, and some of those can cause irritation too, but nothing like hogweed. So again, if you see anything that looks like this other than Queen Anne's lace, you know, take some pictures, note the location, and let us identify it for you because it, it, it can be tricky. So these are hogweed burns, and actually these are, these are not the worst on the web. Um, uh, there are many worse ones that I didn't and decided not to share, but it's, it's a very, very serious burn that takes emergency room treatment. Some other plants can cause skin irritation, like milkweed it, with its latex slap and do, sap, and dogbane has the same sap. Euphorbia has a milky latex-filled sap, too, ranunculus or the buttercup, trumpet creeper, burdock. Uh, these can cause rash in sensitive people. Stinging nettles can cause um, irritation. Virginia creeper in some sensitive people can, can, can be irritating also. There's a new book out from the Socrates Project from UVA, and um, you can uh, look up many uh, other plants. There are many other ones that are toxic that I'm not going to cover here. If you need a chemical control or identification of a plant, just email photos to us about two to three megabytes per email for the photo size, because sometimes it'll, um, the county will block very large uh, photos. But you can get this free poisonous plant book online uh, from uh, University Health, University of Virginia Health. Well, let's talk a little bit about ticks, uh, another unpleasant topic, but um, Chiggers also are out and around in long grasses, so I would recommend that you wear long pants if you're going to be in long grasses and tuck them into your socks. Wear light-colored clothing so you can see if you have any animals, uh, uh, any um, insects on you uh, that you can get rid of them before they bite. So recognize areas that are in potential risk. And if you're hiking, walk in the center of the trail, keep grass cut or keep a trail cut, rake the leaves uh, into a, 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 you know, an area that's not frequented. Um, we certainly want to keep the leaves on your property uh, for other habitat for uh, amphibians and also fireflies require them. A lot of our um, beautiful moths require leaf litter, but rake that into an area that um, you don't need to travel through often. Again, light colored clothing. Um, University of Rhode Island recommends that you don't use DEET. They have not found it to be effective, although other websites will say it is. They recommend permethrin. Uh, you can do not apply that to your skin. Treat your shoes or your, your clothing with that. Um, there are products that you can put on your clothing and then it, it will last about five times in the wash. Or you can purchase clothing um, permeated with permethrin. Uh, in Insect Shield is one brand. There's lots of brands. And that lasts much longer than five washings. Conduct your tick check daily if you're out in tick habitat. Check your pets. You might want to reconsider sleeping with your pet. Um, my vet and many other vets recommend year-round protection in our area. Tick Smart website, if you go to that website, they have a, a Google Calendar for reminders about um, tick protection, and that might be a, a useful website for you to go see. There's some more. Uh, you can put a three-foot barrier of wood chips or gravel uh, to make a barrier between tick territory and lawn area. <clears throat> Keep your playground equipment and patios away from the edges. Put them in a sunny location, although 
some of the ticks do prefer sunny locations. Remove any junk in your yard, trash that gives ticks and rodents a place to hide. I would recommend for tick control in the landscape that you don't do it yourself. University of Rhode Island would confirm that. It's tricky to find where you spray and it may be a waste of time, money, and um, may affect other populations if you don't spray it in the right place. You never want to spray it on flowers because uh, it will affect bees. It's tricky to mix, so I would recommend you hire somebody, but they must be certified uh, as a pesticide applicator and most will use um, permethrin or uh, pyrethroids throids or bifenethrin. Um, on the U University of Rhode Island website, there's a chart for pet products. Um, Lone Star and dog ticks like the sunnier location, but black-legged ticks per for the perimeter that's slightly shady or very shady. Deed is not as effective for ticks as mosquitoes, um, uh, the research has shown. If you put deed on, it stings the feet of the tick and they'll <laughs> high, high step and fall off. It's only effective when freshly applied, but wearing that tick resistant clothing is more effective. The first thing you need to do is figure out what type of tick. Apparently, according to University of Rhode Island, the tick counts are up 30%, especially dog ticks. And so we may be uh, entering an era that ticks are more prevalent. So these are the diseases that are caused by uh, ticks and certain ticks. That's why identifying the type of tick is important. So you want to look at the sputum or shield and that shield will tell you the shape of it stays the same. The tick body gets bigger when they have a blood meal, but they, um, the sputum stays the same. And so that will help you if you can focus on that to ID the tick. But again, you can go to the, you can go to the, um, <clears throat> you can go to, go to an ID website that I'm going to give you, or you can send a, a photo. So don't throw the tick down the drain. Don't put it in the toilet. Take a picture of it or put it in a Ziploc bag in your freezer. So do a tick check every day. Um, I found, I probably found ticks every one of these places. If you find a tick, follow these practices. Um, remove it without squeezing. Use a pointed tweezer. If you squeeze it, it will squeeze in the bacterium that's in the tick's digestive system. Take a photo, you can submit to us, or you, even better, you can go to the Tick Spotter website and submit that tick photo to them, and they can uh, they have professionals to identify. And then if you squeeze the tick, um, it, that releases bacteria into the wound that they've made. Here's, a, here, here's one product that you can use for tick removal, um, and there are a couple products online that are available. For landscaping, here's a, a photo that you can just use for reference for uh, keeping a tick safe zone in your car in your yard. This is from CDC. Here's some resources. I really recommend the Tick Encounter website from University of Rhode Island. They also have a place where you can put uh, submit a photo, and there's a, a map of prevalence of different types of ticks. There are a few stinging caterpillars, so if a caterpillar is fuzzy, these are some of the caterpillars that can sting you, and by golly, they hurt. Um, some of them can ca cause hospitalization. Caterpillars are really important food source for our birds, our backyard birds, but avoid touching any caterpillar with fuzz on it. Wheel bug is another bug that can do you some um, harm. Uh, it's... Thankfully, it's short-lived. Wheel bugs are very good bugs to have in your garden. They're predators of a lot of our pests, uh, and they are incredibly important to the ecosystem, but don't grab one. Um, the pain is very severe when you, um, if you grab one and they start to defend themselves. So watch out for wheel bugs, but keep them in your garden as a predator. Just a word on mosquito spraying. Uh, if you go to, you, if you Google YouTube, uh, mosquito spraying Doug Tallamy, there's a YouTube uh, video on this. It's from his book, Nature's Best Hope. Um, he's a University of Delaware entomologist. Uh, mosquito spraying is indiscriminate. 
it kills not only mosquitoes, but it kill, kills a lot of our beneficial insects that we depend on for pollination, for predation, for, for parasitoids. Um, so oppose mosquito spraying in your area if you, can, if you have anything to do with that. Um, it targets adult mosquitoes, and that's not very effective. Uh, the best control of mosquitoes is in their larval stage. So Doug Tallamy recommends you put a five-gallon bucket of water in a sunny place in your yard, add a handful of hay or straw, and after a few days, this brew is irresistible to pregnant female mosquitoes. Uh, after the mosquitoes have laid their eggs in there, add a mosquito dunk. They're safe. They have that bacillus, which is a... a uh, natural and larvicide and put that in your bucket and they will that will kill them when they hatch that way you can control mosquitoes and only mosquitoes um, also just take a trip around your yard and make sure that all the water has been emptied in, in any little container just a teaspoon of water can allow a mosquito to reproduce oops so questions uh, we'll, we'll entertain some questions from the chat box and again, all of our presentations are posted on our YouTube channel. There's a lot of resources on there that we hope you will take advantage of. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we will um, be answering some questions. Um, from Grant, did you say it's okay if the head remains in the body of the tick? Yeah, that according to um, this PhD that was uh, during the webinar, um, he said that was a myth that you had to get the head out. As long as you get the body out, I mean, you don't squeeze the stuff in, you know. Yeah. He also asked, what is the best thing to buy that prevents mosquitoes? But I think what you just described with the five-gallon ga bucket sounds like the best I've heard. Yeah, it's good. And making sure you don't have water. I mean, that that could take... 24-hour monitoring in, in the wet months. But, you know, even even a teaspoon of water in a leaf, um, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, Nancy, what, what I'm talking about, though, is when you're, like, sitting out on your deck and there's oh. mosquitoes, is there, you see all kinds of gadgets and things that they, rec they claim you can buy and it keeps the mosquitoes 100 yards away from you. Is that, do you find that to be true? I think you can use a repellent and you can manage uh, the water on your property. But as far as those products go, here's what I would suggest. That you Google and look for research on any of those devices. I don't know that there's been any reputable research on any of those zappers or whatever they are. So what I would put in is mosquito um, control devices dot ext or dot edu and look to see if you find some reputable peer-reviewed um, um, articles uh, concerning that. I, I cannot recommend any of those products. I, I just don't have that knowledge. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned permethrin. You shouldn't get on your skin. I guess I didn't know that. Is it to uh, toxic or? I, you know, I, I know there's a warning on it. And, and I have permethrin treated socks, yeah. pants, and shirt. So that is, that is the, the, the way that um, this webinar uh, described using permethrin, not on your skin. Yeah, because at the teaching garden, uh, several people have their clothes treated. Yeah, I think it's wise, really. Yeah. Because there's so many. I mean, and it looks like tick populations are going up, at least for, yeah. for the dog ticks. Any other questions? Anybody? Guess that's it. I hope you're not too depressed. You know, we still want you to opt outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that we're having a dry spell, the um, pop, the mosquito population should decrease a little bit. For the moment, yeah. For the moment. Yeah, they're in. They're waiting. They're waiting. Well, thank you all for coming today. And if you don't have any other questions, then this will be um, posted in next, you know, four or five days on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Nancy. I love especially the snakes. Oh, good. And, and please fill out the evaluation. It's just a quick evaluation when you get it from Christina Hastings. And next week is um, 
what are we doing next week? Sweet potatoes, is it? Or uh, we should next week will be um, discussion of rabies. Oh, that's right. With the crazy raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the registration link will be in the things. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Nancy and everybody. See you later. Thank Have you. a good day. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our best lawns coordinator, Natalie Walker at nwalker at pwcgov.org. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.